Hello and welcome to another video lesson from Epic Rehab. I'm Dr. Leonard Matheson. Today's lesson is a reprise of a clinical research consortium teleconference. This is an introduction for occupational therapists on the subject of executive dysfunction and work. Executive function is the ability to integrate component cognitive abilities to produce complex performance. I like to emphasize integrate because this is a crucial issue for occupational therapists. It's even better to use the word orchestrate to consider the abilities that occupational therapists tap into as the person attempts to perform a complex task or activity. It's this ability to orchestrate that lies at the heart of executive function. Depending on age, the human brain has between 85 billion and 120 billion neurons supported by about 10 times that many glial cells. As we look at the cerebral cortex, we see neuron cell bodies packed closely together. Extending below the cell bodies are axons. Neurons can have up to 30,000 connections extending from their axons, with each neuron averaging about 10,000 connections. This early diffusion tensor image depicts the fiber bundles extending from the neuron cell body. The disruption of these axonal connections by concussion, stroke, physical insult, or illness interferes with cognitive component orchestration. The inability to orchestrate component cognitive abilities produces executive dysfunction. Executive dysfunction creates several disabling limitations. I want to present three of the most important to you in this video lesson. The first important disability factor produced by executive dysfunction has to do with diminished productivity. Slower cognitive processing speed diminishes productivity. Limited span of cognitive coordination limits the ability to handle complex processing and diminishes productivity. A second important disability factor produced by executive dysfunction has to do with safety. The inability to maintain attention produces safety problems. The inability to appropriately handle interpersonal disruption produces safety problems. This leads to the third important disability factor produced by executive dysfunction. The inability to discern subtle interpersonal cues leads to interpersonal disruption. The inability to inhibit emotional reactivity leads to interpersonal disruption. Now, in our clinical work with clients who've experienced concussions, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and brain illnesses that lead to executive dysfunction, we must deal with the aftermath. The initial experience of executive dysfunction leads to anxiety, a natural response to the awareness of inability. The world becomes less manageable with executive dysfunction. We develop a growing awareness of incompetence with executive dysfunction. Our ability to meet responsibilities at home or at work or in the community is degraded by executive dysfunction. Occupational therapists and psychologists and physicians can help avoid or limit anxiety with proper explanations and assistance, but even with proper intervention, anxiety as a consequence of executive dysfunction is prevalent. Often, sustained anxiety and a growing sense of incompetence leads to depression. At first, this is a natural grief response to the loss of security and status and hope. As with anxiety, caregivers and family can help to avoid or limit the depressive response. But this often seems to be the inevitable consequence of executive dysfunction flowing from anxiety. This is one of the reasons that early intervention with education and appropriate goal setting is so important. Occupational therapists provide extremely beneficial support to the work that psychologists are attempting as we address depression. Unfortunately, occupational therapy often is postponed until the consequences of executive dysfunction get really bad. I am a strong advocate for early occupational therapy intervention to avoid chronic depression and work disability. It's very unfortunate when we don't have an interdisciplinary team available for the person to address anxiety and depression that are a consequence of executive dysfunction. Executive dysfunction is a major risk factor for suicide because it robs people of their identity and sense of competence and ultimately their hope. Over my almost 50 years of practice in helping people put their lives back together after experiencing severe disabilities, executive dysfunction continues to be the risk factor that I most want to avoid. I am more afraid of executive dysfunction leading to suicide than any other risk factor. 
Now, we don't have time in this lesson to do much more than introduce you to the broad types of executive dysfunction. As an introduction, we can think in terms of executive dysfunction broadly as occurring in the metacognitive and productive arena, and executive dysfunction with regard to emotional and behavioral self-control. There are five metacognitive types of executive dysfunction. Initiation of tasks and ideas, working memory and attention span, planning and organizing tasks and activities, monitoring tasks for mistakes and completion, organizing materials and resources to implement tasks and ideas and activities. There are four major emotional behavioral types of executive dysfunction. Difficulties with inhibiting impulsivity and distraction, limitations in ability to shift from one task or approach to another, limited emotional control and reactivity, diminished self-monitoring of behavior. Whenever I work with a person who has experienced a concussion or stroke or physical insult to the brain or has a brain disease, I screen for executive dysfunction. These are the two measures that I use. The behavior rating inventory of executive function is comprised of 75 items. It has separate self-report and informant report formats and good normative data. The rough neurobehavioral inventory is comprised of 243 items in a self-report format with good normative data. I more often use the brief. Now, I don't want to overwhelm you with data, but I would like to provide you with one simple case study. We will use data from the brief to construct two executive dysfunction profiles. This is a 22-year-old female I will call Judy, who experienced a concussion while playing basketball. She returned home from college to live with her parents and came to see me three months after the incident. Judy's father and mother completed the brief on a blind and independent basis. Here we have the profiles of her father's rating of Judy. The profile uses a T-score, which is a normative score based on Judy's age, compared to other people in their late teens and early 20s. On the left side of the profile are the major emotional behavioral types of executive dysfunction. On the right side of the profile are the major metacognitive types of executive dysfunction. Judy's father rates her as having somewhat elevated executive dysfunction, but generally within the normal range for emotional behavior. Conversely, he rates her very dysfunctional for all but one area of metacognition. In other video lessons on this channel, we take a much closer look at these scores and how to address them. Judy's mother rates her daughter much higher on the emotional behavioral areas of executive dysfunction than her husband did. Her ratings of Judy on the metacognitive types of executive dysfunction are similar to her husband's ratings of Judy. Let's compare the two. The first thing to notice is that the blind and independent ratings done by the mother and father track each other quite well. This is a crucial indicator of the reliability of observation measures, and one of the reasons I like the brief. Although the brief does have four reliability indicators built in, using it on a blind and independent basis is extremely useful. I also contemporaneously administered the brief to Judy. We don't have time here to go into her scores and how they compare to her parents' scores and what this means. We do that in other video lessons. What I do want to do now in this lesson is to look at the emotional behavioral scores to help you understand them better. We really just have four individual scales here. Inhibit, shift, emotional control, and self-monitor are the individual scales, and behavioral regulation is a composite of the four clinical scales. The mother is either more aware of or more sensitive to her daughter's behavioral dysregulation. Her husband's ratings of Judy's behavior indicate that he has less awareness of her difficulties in this area. He doesn't see much in the way of problems here other than difficulties that Judy has with shifting approaches and adjusting to change. Subsequent interviews with both parents led me to conclude that the mother is more sensitive to these areas of difficulty because she's aware of how they are disrupting Judy's social relationships, of which the father has less information. It also turns out that Judy is less acquiescent with her mother than she is with her father. For young adults who have returned home after a concussion, this is quite common. That's the end of part one. In part two of this lesson, we'll look at how occupational therapists use structured work activity groups or SWAGs to identify executive dysfunction.